My name is Trevor Bernard. I'm the uh, Wilberforce Professor of Slavery and Emancipation and Director of the Wilberforce Institute uh, in, uh, with its premises uh, next, to, next to Wilberforce House uh, in, in, in Old Town. Uh, this is, some, this is a, a somewhat different uh, event than the Wilberforce Institute usually, uh, usually sponsors, but we're very delighted uh, to be able to sponsor this particular event today, uh, which deals with really important issues uh, on whether scholarly knowledge should be free and open to all uh, and what that means uh, for, for scholarship, uh, for the public uh, and, and for the life in general. Um, it's uh, great, my great pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Professor Peter Ball, when there will be a panel discussion uh, later on I'll introduce those people separately. Uh, we have a lot of people online uh, as well as the audience today, so we'll try and make sure that uh, we, we have time to, for questions both for people online and for people today. Uh, Peter Baldwin, uh, who we're very proud, pleased to have welcome here today, is a Professor of History at UCLA uh, Emeritus uh, and Global Distinguished Professor at NYU. Uh, and he has many strings to his bow. He's not only an accomplished and prolific historian, uh, he's also a public intellectual, uh, writing on both European history and on matters of contemporary importance. Uh, in the former, he's the author of The Politics of Social Solidarity, uh, Cloud Class Basis of the European Welfare State, uh, 1875 to 1975, uh, and many articles on comparative uh, historical development, particularly the comparative historical development of the modern state. Uh, he's also turned his attention to contemporary issues. Uh, he's, he's extraordinarily prolific, just having written uh, in 2021, uh, an important book on how different countries dealt with the with, with COVID-19, uh, fighting the first wave, why the coronavirus was the coronavirus was tackled differently across the globe. Uh, and unusually for a historian, uh, he takes an active role in public life, writing articles in the press where he's a frequent contributor, and most importantly being a board member of several very important institutions uh, in America and in Europe. Uh, for today's purpose, perhaps the most important uh, of these are his board membership of the New York Public Library and the American Council of Learned Societies. Uh, he co-founded uh, with his wife, Elizabeth uh, Rousing, the Arcadia Fund, uh, an extremely important uh, fund within arts and humanities, which has given over $1 billion uh, to, to, uh, to charities that prefers, preserve cultural heritage. It also has, and this is, this is connected with today's talk, a specific strand of, uh, devoted uh, to promoting open access based on the principle uh, that access to knowledge is a fundamental human right. And this is what he's going to be talking about us today. Uh, his most recent book, Athena Unbound, Why and How Scholarly Knowledge Should Be Free, uh, Free for All, uh, is published both as a hardback by MIT Press, uh, this year or last year, I can't remember, one or two years, it's very recent anyway, and it's also available uh, as an open access book. Uh, he, Peter addresses these, this topic of open access uh, and the, whether scholarly knowledge should be free for all uh, from a particular perspective, uh, from the perspective of a scholar, from a perspective of an expert on all aspects to do with information, and from a perspective also as a prominent philanthropist. Uh, we're absolutely delighted on behalf of the Wilberforce Institute at the University of Hull uh, and the Knowledge Equity Network uh, to welcome Peter Baldwin to talk about Athena Unbound. I'll just mention a couple of words about the Knowledge Equity Network uh, and then introduce, uh, then, then, then allow Peter to, uh, to, 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 to give a talk for 45 minutes. Uh, then we'll have a, 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 we'll have a panel discussion uh, on various aspects of the book and I'll introduce the panel members uh, later on. Uh, but a couple of words about the Knowledge Equity Network. It's a collaborative global network of higher education institutions, organisations and individuals working towards the principles outlined in the Declaration of Knowledge Equity. Uh, please do take a moment to sign the Declaration of Knowledge Equity Net uh, Declaration on the knowledgeequitynetwork.org uh, website uh, if you haven't done so already. Uh, there also will be a QR, there is also a QR code to take you to the declaration at the final slide at the end of this event. Uh, but without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome Peter to Hull uh, and look forward very much to uh, his talk. Peter.
Thank you, Trevor. You make me blush. Um, many more accomplishments than I claim any paternity uh, uh, to on normal circumstances. I'm delighted and honored to be here at the Wilberforce and the Knowledge Equity, a confluence of two institutions that have something to do uh, with freeing things up in one way or the other. I'm flattered to be allowed to uh, address them. So I want to talk sort of speaking generally uh, about things that are in the book, but in particular, as I've indicated on the title that I would have given you had I been asked, the, uh, the question of you know what, what do we do in the digital age to try to recreate something along the lines of the Library of Alexandria. And let me begin with a couple of points that will be perfectly obvious to everyone here, but sort of for the purposes of clarification. And the first is digital technologies allow us to reproduce and to disseminate content almost costlessly. They are necessary for open access, but they're of course not sufficient for it. Open access requires digitality, but digitality isn't necessarily open. Spotify and Netflix, as we all know, are cheap and ubiquitous, but they're not open access in the sense that they provide content at no cost. Using digitality, we can produce almost first, perfect first copies of works, whether we're talking about music or film or anything printed, and in that sense, we can all be publishers now. There are lots of efficiencies that are created by digitality, even at the stage of the first copy of a work. But that is, it seems to me, the least of digitality's accomplishments. The real zinger comes with the last copy, the copy at the margin. That is now all but costless. Producing yet another copy of a work adds only a tiny fraction of total cost. And of course, unlike analog copies, that copy is as perfect and pristine as the first. And even better, those copies can be distributed to the entire world, again, almost at no cost. Given a web connection, anyone can post anything for the world to read. 60% of the world's population now has access to the internet at some 5 billion people. The world may not, of course, pay any attention to whatever it is that we post, but if we do post it, it's up there for anyone who wants to read it, to watch it, to listen to it, and so forth. So this is the fundamental technological breakthrough that makes open access possible, not so much the efficiencies of the first copy as the costlessness of the last copy. And that brings us to open access, properly speaking. The last copy is free, but the first copy costs money, and who is to pay for that? In the analog world, consumers paid for it. Content was like any other physical object that you bought and sold. If you wanted it, you had to pay for it. In the digital world, of course, consumers can still pay for content. They obviously do for films and music and periodicals and eBooks and so forth. But for the first time in history, once the costs of the first copy have been met, consumers no longer need to be charged if the producer agrees. That raises the obvious question, what content producer on earth, what author, doesn't want to charge for content? And here we come to the nub of open access. For commercial content, for film, music, novels, and so forth, sales on the market have to generate the income necessary for their production and for their dissemination. Novelists live off their sales, scientists do not. In contrast with scientific content, production has already been paid for, usually by government or other funders, and the only thing that remains to be paid for in scientific production is dissemination. Open access is essentially about the cost of disseminating content whose production has already been covered. So some authors do want to charge for content. Those who live from their work, for whom the sale is necessary, for these kinds of authors, the digital technologies are a convenience, they're not a game changer. These authors can now profit from the costlessness of the last copy. They can make even more money than they would have in the analog world. How that works out in prices tends to vary. Some kinds of eBooks, such as Kindle, are cheaper than their physical version. But when publishers sell ebooks to libraries, they actually charge more than for physical copies and more than they charge individual retail customers. That is, the publishers exerting their monopoly powers and policing the libraries for as much as they can. For example, in this case, this is Christopher Leslie Brown's book on abolitionism, Moral Capital 
It costs $42 on Amazon for an individual buyer. The Kindle edition costs $13. The publisher, of course, still profits because they don't have the cost of physically producing copies. But meanwhile, when a library buys an e-copy that it wants to keep forever, it pays $94. Why is that? Simply because the publishers are allowed to gouge the market. So digital technology allows publishers to cash in on the dematerialization of content. But these authors and their publishers who want to and who deserve to be paid for their content are not the only authors in existence. There are other authors who are more interested in being read or being heard or otherwise having an intellectual impact more interested in that than they are in making money. First and most obvious in this group are the salaried academics who are paid for their research and writing by wages and for whom royalties really should not be a consideration. This includes more or less all research scientists. From their very beginnings in the 17th century, scientific journals have never paid for content. Those who publish in them do so in order to be read by colleagues, in order to make their mark, in order to enhance their professional reputations. Now, obviously, some scientists produce patentable works that are valuable. Universities and scientists have learned how to divide the spoils. Researchers who work for corporations, such as Boeing or IBM or whatever, of course, get no royalties. But university researchers can cash in on their patentable discoveries, and they end up splitting the proceeds with their universities. But on the whole, the professoriate does not depend on selling its IP to earn its living. The professoriate is rewarded by salaries. The professoriate is rewarded by uh, prestige and symbolic laurels given by the academy. They're rewarded by security of employment, by advancement, by relief from teaching, by awards, prizes, lectures, and so forth. Now, an even larger number of authors than these salaried professors, an even larger number of authors might want to live off their work. They might want to earn royalties, but the reality is that they do not. The vast majority of would-be authors cannot, and they do not live off their work. Someday, of course, any one of them may have a breakthrough moment, and they may make their fortunes, but most of them live in vain. The Authors Guild conducted a survey, the sobering conclusion of which is that whatever their desires, most authors cannot or do not live off their output. For these authors, the increased attention that they could get if their works were freely available might, in fact, be more important than the few extra dollars that they could earn in royalties. The point is that many authors, probably the vast majority of authors, do not or cannot sell their work. Now that takes us to the nature of authorship and how it has changed over the years. And I want to make three points here. The first is that Copyright was instituted in the 18th century to benefit independent creators. These were the authors who were independent in two respects. They created individually and independently. They were inspired by their muse and beholden to no one else. They alone therefore deserved whatever credit was due to their works. This is Karl Schmitt's famous, famous painting, apparently the most beloved painting among Germans of the Bohemian artiste in his, in his attic. They were independent also in a second sense in the sense that they hoped to live off their work, which they sold to the public. So in other words, artistically, they were bohemians, but economically, they were artisans. They sold their wares. Now, the economic underpinnings of authorship have changed since this era when copyright was first instituted. First of all, there are many more creators than there were earlier. The number of scientists and engineers in the United States has expanded tenfold over the first three quarters of the 20th century. Knowledge-based professionals now make up somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of the labor force in industrialized economies. Of these creators, many more are also salaried than earlier. Per capita, for example, Germany today has a dozen times more professors than it did in the 1830s. In other words, the numbers of independent authors or creators has drastically diminished. The second point about the nature, the changing nature of authorship is that research and creativity is much more collaborative now. Rather than solitary artists in their garrets, we now have research teams and vast collective cultural enterprises. Now, obviously, there remain some solitary art forms. There are sonnets and sonatas and still lives and novels and so forth. But most everything else is collaborative. 
sculptures, frescoes, architecture, theater, opera, symphonies, uh, not least of all, film. And this collaborative nature of creativity today is even more true for science. Scientific articles now have enormous numbers of co-authors. One of them in 2012 announced the observation of the Higgs particle at the Large Hadron Collector, a collider. The work was written by almost 3,000 co-authors, of whom 22 had already died by the time the article appeared. This is another article that has 5,000 authors. On the screen, you only have the ones to take us uh, through the A's. Film is much the same way on a slightly smaller scale. The average Hollywood film crew is 500, but it can easily be 3,000. And finally, the third point I want to make about authorship is that the nature of authorship has changed. We've moved away from the romantic idiom of the individual creator who responds to their muse, who is individually responsible for the work, and who owns it fully and unconditionally. Instead, we now follow, follow a more postmodernist ethos. We discount individual inspiration. We acknowledge that creators are indebted to past examples and to other authors as part of the creative process. We accept bricolage and pastiche as, as possible creative techniques. Indeed, at the extreme, we accept plagiarism and the copying of others' works. In other words, romanticism's strong link between the individual creator and the work has largely been effaced. The idea that copyright recognizes the claims of authors to their works isn't nearly as convincing as it once was. The upshot is that copyright applies to ever fewer authors, and even those authors to whom copyright applies have an aesthetically much diminished claim to their works. If works are no longer the product of individual inspiration, authors can't really insist that they should control and profit from them. One of the most Extreme examples is for Sherry Levine, whose copies of Walker Evans photographs are indistinguishable to the naked eye, and yet she claims uh, artistic authorship of them. The upshot is that there are more authors producing more work than ever before, but a smaller percentage of them ought to be against open access because fewer of them live off of selling their works, and many of them are paid via salaries and therefore have no reason to claim more than aesthetic and moral control over their work. The changing nature of authorship therefore increasingly inclines towards making content open. But that is just one factor behind the question of open access. Commercial authors, commercial publishers and disseminators are still, of course, against open access because they want to be paid for their content, and rightly so. The film and music industries, the commercial publishing industry, have all made accommodations to digitality so that access has been greatly expanded, even though it is not necessarily entirely open. 20 years ago, in the frontier days of the web, pirates ripped off commercial content with impunity. We had Napster and Pirate Bay and Mega Upload and these sorts of sites that posted content against the wishes of the rights holders. That was all shut down, and instead we now have the regularized disseminators. Spotify and Apple Music, Netflix and Prime Video, Amazon Prime, at least in the US, costs something like $13 a month, and it gives access to some 13,000 films for the price of effectively one trip to the cinema monthly. As lending libraries, which is effectively what uh, these things are, that is a pretty good deal. For books, digital editions tend to be cheaper than the paper ones, and you can, of course, still borrow them, for them from libraries. But none of this goes to the core of open access. The core of open access concerns scholarly literature. Only some research is susceptible to the moral logic of open access. The bulk of research is performed by corporations in their own interests, somewhere between two thirds and three quarters of the total. No one expects this to be open access. No one expects this to be necessarily available to anyone outside the corporation. Much of it indeed is proprietary. But the basic scientific research that is conducted by universities or other sorts of institutions is mostly paid for by taxpayers, either directly or indirectly. And therefore, there is a moral claim from the taxpayer who pays for it to be allowed access to it. Open access means that disseminating research is effectively paid for by the producer, no longer the consumer, in this case, the taxpayer. 
Now, from the publisher or the disseminator's vantage, whether they're paid by consumers who fork over the retail price, as happens with conventional <laughs> publishing, or whether they're paid by funders who pay the publishing charges for articles or books, as with open access, this is largely irrelevant, as long as the sums involved are broadly the same. Indeed, you could say that there are advantages for publishers with open access. When they get the money up front the way they do, when they levy a publishing charge, that puts even book publishers in the same favorable position as journal publishers. They get their money ahead of time, and therefore they don't care whether the book is successful on the market or not. Now, this means, of course, that book publishers will miss out on a few runaway bestsellers. And it's not that they don't exist. There are a couple examples here. But how often do we see runaway bestsellers among scholarly or university press works? Conversely, these same publishers will be insured against the many books that don't even repay their publishing costs. As long as someone is willing to pay for publication, publishers can be happy with open access. And that is, in fact, largely what has happened with scientific publication. The scientific journals have discovered that even with open access, they can make the same good money they did in the analog world of subscription journals. The reason they can do that is twofold. First of all, there are funders to pay for the cost of dissemination. In scientific research, the cost of research and writing has to be paid for by someone other than the consumer. The cost of writing a novel or a volume of poetry is whatever it takes to keep the author alive or not. That can be more or less. You could be starving in your garret like Kalschwitzweg here, or you could be Barbara Cartman swanking about in your Bentley. But for scientific research, the sums are huge across the board. For every scientific article published in the US, there is on average $290,000 of research funding behind it. Keep in mind that scientists publish many more articles than the humanities and social sciences are used to. There are 8,000 physicists who issue at least 72 articles annually. In other words, on average, one every five days. Do the math. 72 times 280, that is $20 million per prolific physicist annually. If you, the reader of physics articles, had to pay for that baked into the price of the articles, they would, of course, be very expensive indeed. But in the case of science, the research costs have been separated out from the dissemination costs and separately financed in a way that is not true for commercial content, such as novels. Imagine what the expense would be if articles on high energy physics, uh, uh, what they would cost if they had to bake in the building and the running costs of the Hadron Collider into their subscription prices. You see the figures here. It would be something on the order of $3 million per article. For scientific content, the cost of dissemination is actually a very small part of research funding overall, some two or three percent of the total. The scientific publishers are not part of financing the production of content in the way that commercial publishers are. They have the luxury of being only the disseminators. They piggyback off the content that someone else has paid for. The second reason why the scientific publishers have recognized that open access works for them is that already during the analog era, of subscription journals, they discovered a source of financing that continued into the digital age, and that is the acquisitions budgets of major research libraries. The serials crisis is a term that's usually used to describe the gutting of library budgets by scientific publishers starting sometime in the 1980s, in other words, long before digitality. They started issuing many new and often highly specialized journals, of which there are some examples here, by their nature, academic journals are not substitutable, unlike other consumer products. You know, Chardonnay prices go up, you switch to Pinot Grigio. You can't do that with scientific publications. A librarian has to buy them all, since researchers are not going to go off and read a cheaper art article on the Higgs boson if one day a day uh, the one they wanted costs too much. Now, this means that librarians had to buy whatever the publishers put out, however many journals there were. Furthermore, the publishers started jacking up their prices far above the rate of inflation. The outcome was that library budgets were increasingly drained off towards the bottom line of the major scientific publishers of Elsevier, of Springer, of Wiley, and you know, corporations like this. 
And the monies that the libraries had left over once the scientific publishers had had their fill were so little that ever fewer monographs and other books could be bought. The outcome of these trends was that scientific publishers continued making juicy profit margins of some 30 or 40 percent, regardless of whether they collected subscriptions for analog journals or whether they collected publishing charges for open access journals. They milked the system for all it's worth. The most prestigious of them charge article publishing charges just as they charge the highest subscription fees. Nature, for example, squeezes the prestige value of its name, so the pip squeak, and it costs almost $12,000 per article to publish in Nature. Most other journals charge somewhere between two and $4,000. Journals have also cleverly set up hybrid journals that have some open access content that is paid extra for and some subscription content that is still locked up. And that allows them, of course, to double dip, collecting both income streams since libraries can't sub stop subscribing to these journals. Here, for example, is the Quarterly Journal of Economics with some open content and some not. The top one, the blue green dot, is the uh, open article. The one underneath it is closed. And when you try to get into the one uh, that's closed, this is the hurdle uh, that you have to jump. I don't know if that's legible from back there, but it is uh, $39 to be allowed to read an article for 24 hours, which is a, seems to be a pretty stiff price to pay. Another example of publishers milking things for all their worth is here. It's entirely commonplace for a review of a book to cost more than the book itself. Here's a review of a book on the medieval Mediterranean in the English Historical Review. It's a bargain at $51, while the book itself costs $42 on the CUP website. Now, all this works for science. They've gutted research library budgets for their own purposes. They're content with what is known as gold or diamond open access. In other words, open access where the costs are paid for either by the authors or on behalf of authors by third party funders. But this leaves the humanities and the social sciences out the cold. Libraries can no longer afford the cost of monographs, and humanities and social science journals find it hard to flip to open access since their authors have no research funding to pay. Such scholars have therefore tended to favor what is known as green open access. Green open access makes freely available a version of content that, in one way or another, is less valuable than the version of record. Either it comes out later, it's released several years after publication, for the humanities and the social sciences, this is a less pressing issue than for the sciences, where timing is often crucial and discoveries come rapidly and lose their importance quickly. Or, on the other hand, the content is sometimes hobbled in the sense that it's somehow inferior and therefore doesn't compete. It's a typescript of an article or a book rather than the typeset final version, for example. Now, such versions of open access, green versions of open access, are cheaper than the gold and diamond version, since they coexist with conventional publication instead of substituting for it. And in fact, they don't challenge it. Indeed, the green system has overall costs that are higher since conventional publication continues while the cost of these new open access versions now also has to be met. And of course, the final output of green open access is not quite up to snuff with the canonical version with all the disadvantages that follow from that. In other words, the problem of open access is not so much the sciences of the first world, which have solved the problem largely for themselves. It is much more a problem for the, for the humanities and the social sciences of the first world. And of course, it remains a problem for all scholars in the global south. Everyone can now read the output of those scientists in the first world who have managed to make the system work for them. That is obviously a huge advantage. But as players, those scholars who don't have the funding to make their work open access are left out. In the days of subscription journals, readers who didn't have access to research libraries were excluded by paywalls. Open access solves that problem. But in the process, gold and diamond open access creates a new problem of paywalls. These, of course, are the barriers to would-be authors who cannot afford publication costs. Now, there are plenty of arguments for why open access is the route to go. I've already touched on the moral argument that those who pay for the research deserve access to it. There are 
Obviously, arguments from public welfare, that research and knowledge improves the more it's shared. Linus's law states that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. As networks expand, the utility of being connected rises, and that is enhanced greatly by open access compared to conventional publication. There are obviously social justice arguments that claim that knowledge ought to be distributed and spread as widely as possible. All this is fairly obvious that I'm not going to dwell on it. The global south should, of course, be able to read the world's content. But just as interesting is the ability to allow the developing world scholars to become equal participants in the research mission. Now, this raises two issues at the core of open access. What is it going to cost to make all scholarly content open? And where will these monies come from? The Library of Alexandria, run by the Ptolemies of Egypt in the first century after Christ, was the first and arguably the last attempt to unify all of human knowledge in one location. In the pre prince era, the best that they could do was to collect manuscripts, and they had managed to amass a collection of some hundred thousand works. Once printing had been invented, in theory, all written knowledge could be collected since you could easily make copies. But now the practicalities of amassing all these works proved to be overwhelming. The great national libraries were the closest we came to a universal library in the Prince era. The Library of Congress in Washington is the largest of these, with some 39 million works. The world's output, I estimate, over the centuries to be some 250 million books that have been printed uh, during humanity's time span, so that a global library, assuming a collection of 250 million works, would have to be some six times the size of the Library of Congress. That suggests that it would need a budget of 25 billion in acquisitions, assuming that you could actually buy all these uh, books, and it assumes that you would have to have a, a building that costs a bit north of, of, of a billion dollars, and the running cost would be something on the order of four and a half billion dollars annually. UNESCO is our current closest approximation at global cooperation. It has an annual budget of some 650 million annually, so that's about seven times what a global analog uh, library would cost. And of course, that's not considering the question of where to locate an institution and the fact that obviously this is a singular establishment to which the world's scholars would have to make a pilgrimage. Now, because of digitality and open access, of course, we have the possibility of a new Alexandrian library, the possibility of a truly global repository of all printed content. But what would it cost? We don't have to go through the particulars. These are sort of back of the envelope uh, uh, numbers that I've put together. If we assume that about 250 million books have been published up through 2021, we knock off the last 10 years of books that are uh, still in print and still commercially valuable, that leave some 50 million books in the public domain, 180 or so in print and in copyright. In other words, about 230 books altogether, uh, 230 million. We subtract the 25 million that Google has already scanned. We have 206 million that need scanning. You see the rest of up, up here. We get a grand sum of something on the order of $2.6 billion of the cost that it would take to scan every book in existence minus the last 20 years. That is a cost that is about 15% of the inflation adjusted price of the Getty Museum in LA. It's about one fifth the going rate of an aircraft carrier, and it's about the same price as 10 Boeing 747s. It is, in other words, a bargain at twice, I'm going to say thrice, I will even go so far as to say 10 times the cost. It gets you all of the print creativity of humanity freely available, available anywhere on the globe to anyone who has an internet connection. Now, let us compare the cost of such a global analog library with the global digital open access library. The costs of this are much more for past content, but not for current works. The, book, the world publishes something like 2.2 million books a, a year and about 3 million articles a year. Of the books published, these 2 million or so, some 440,000, about 20%, are scholarly monographs, which are the only ones we can make a reasonable argument for, should be uh, open access. If it costs two hundred dollars per monograph to buy and to uh, to make open access. That's eighty-eight million. If there are thirty thousand journals and each annual subscription is sixteen hundred, that's fifty-one million. So 
In other words, something on the order of 139 million running costs to make a global analog library. That is for a single copy of each work in one distinct place. Open access on the web will cost more. To make available all past content, we've, as we've seen, comes in at about two and a half billion dollars, which is much less than the analog version of it. But for ongoing content, this is going to be more uh, expensive if we're aiming for full accessibility via open access. There are some three million articles published annually. If we assume a, uh, an average uh, article publication charge of 2,000, that's 6 billion. Books, of course, are slightly more complicated. Of these 2.2 million books published annually, I, as I said, about 440 are scholarly monographs. These are the only ones I think we can make a moral argument for should be open access. And the rest, of course, will have to be bought in the conventional manner by libraries, either on, in paper or digital format. An open access publishing cost for books is usually something on the order of $10,000, so that's $4.4 billion. Add in the six that we've got, running costs annually of about $10 billion for a global digital library. That is 72 times the cost of a global analog scholarly library, which means that for the price of 72 copies of every scholarly monograph and the price of 72 subscriptions for every scientific journal, we could make academic content available to everyone. Now keep firmly in mind that there are about 80,000 academic libraries globally. So this means that we're dealing with some bulk purchasing in its best possible form, except that the discount that we're offered here through bulk purchasing is not just that something is shaved off the price of the content, it is that we are making it freely available for everyone to read. Now, having said that, $10 billion a year is undeniably a hefty sum. So the question is, where is it going to come from? The reality is that the money is already there in the library system. It just needs to be used for new ends. These are the spending figures for American research libraries and American libraries of all sorts, and then also global academic libraries, which, as you see, uh, spend about $6 billion on content with all libraries spending about 30 billion on content. So the cost of 10 billion in ongoing content acquisition is the maximum that it could cost. In other words, it's at prices as they are currently set by publishers. So savings are certainly going to be possible in cost. Article publishing charges are set by publishers at as high a level as they can get, just as subscriptions were jacked up to the max. But is this realistic? or reasonable for the publishers to continue doing so. In Latin America, where most scholarly publishing is done in open access journals, article publishing charges are in three, not four figures. The Mellon Foundation calculated that in the industrialized world, a reasonable article publishing charge would be somewhere between two, uh, between one and two thousand dollars. So costs should be able to be trimmed in a way that, uh, to, to knock a great deal off that $10 billion figure. And the same goes for books. The average book publishing charge ranges from five to $15,000. I've been using 10 as a reasonable figure, but there's no real reason why that couldn't be brought down. And further savings are imaginable in the way that open access texts are conveyed to the public. I've mentioned green open access already. One version of this is the posting of TypeScripts and that is, in effect, what open access repositories do. Most scientific fields, as you know, publish only articles and never books. Some academic fields don't even bother with articles any longer. In the sciences, manuscripts circulate or they're posted and they're read long before publication. The published articles are really just for the future historians of science. No one in the field actually reads them. Other fields in the sciences don't even bother with a final published version. Computer science, mathematics, theoretical physics, for example, these all post conference proceedings and TypeScript prefix. Scholars read and evaluate each other's work on this basis, and conventional publication is no longer really an issue. If one imagined other fields shifting to this model, dissemination would become much cheaper as it moves from publication in the old-fashioned sense of something that is you know, typeset and printed and bound and distributed and shelved and so forth. If you just post an article on a website like Archive, which is where theoretical physicists do that, that costs you $10, in other words, two figures and not four figures. 
And these are all savings on the supply side. On the demand side, savings are possible in library budgets. As we've seen, library acquisition budgets come close to being able to finance all scholarly output open access. But of course, not all content will be open access. Libraries will still have to buy conventional commercial works, so we can't just appropriate libraries' entire acquisition budgets as such, but we could certainly take a big chunk of it. Acquisitions, however, is only one of library's many expenses. You also have the cost of taking care of the physical media. Now, obviously, digital media have their own costs. Servers are not cheap, they consume lots of electricity, files have to be updated, they have to be made retrospectively compatible with software upgrades and so forth and so on, and yet they offer vast economies compared to conventional libraries for no other reason we knew the only one or two of them, not tens of thousands of them. To house a book in OpenStax costs a little north of four dollars a year per volume. There are about a billion individual volumes in North American research libraries, 95% of them are duplicates spread throughout the library system. In other words, we have 950 million books that are housed, bound, shelled, reshelled, heated, cooled, and otherwise taken care of. Do the math. In theory, that is a cost of some $4 billion a year. That's probably exaggerated because no library budget actually has that sort of money in it for this sort of thing, and there are probably cheaper ways to store, but it gives a sense of the problem. U.S. research libraries uh, employ a staff of some close to 90,000 people. They're paid something on the order of three and a half billion dollars a year. Salaries and wages are about one half of total research library costs. Now, no one, least of all me, wants to start firing librarians, but staff can certainly be slimmed down in the digitized future. In other words, the monies that are needed to publish all scholarly content in an open access format largely exist in the library system, but the money has to be repurposed. That doesn't mean that it will be. It's a political question. But the argument that we can't afford open access is simply not true. Let me return, by way of conclusion, to Alexandria. A global Alexandrian library in the analog era was just about thinkable. But even if it had been possible, it would not have been more than one institution in one place to which everyone would have to go. Having the same data available at every laptop is, of course, a quantum leap beyond that. A global library is possible only if we move away from the conventional consumer pays model of publishing to a producer pays. Given the quantity of data in a global collection, no other funding model is feasible. Not only that, but the total amount of information is growing faster than ever. Indeed, it's growing so fast that some people complain that there is simply too much information. So the question is, do open access and information overload go hand in hand? There's a lot of talk about how science publishers are putting out more and more information and possibly too much information. There is certainly more information published every year. Is there too much information? Indeed, what would too much information even mean? One argument that there is too much information goes something like this. Each researcher is putting out more and more, the neoliberal university squeezes its academic drones to greater feats of productivity. It makes them publish ever more. Sometimes they achieve this by salami slicing the results, publishing ever shorter articles with less content, but more of them. Is this true? The evidence suggests that it's not. One countervailing factor is that ever more scientific articles are written collaboratively. In the 1890s, 98% of, of all articles in the New England Journal of Medicine were written by a single author. Today, the figure is 5%. Once you divide the growing number of articles by the growing number of collaborators, it is revealed that the actual number of articles per researcher is flat or even slightly declining, depending on who's doing the measuring. But there's a more meaningful argument on the increase of information. More and more researchers from ever more countries are spitting out work. Scientific research is no longer the preserve of middle-aged white guys from the developed world. The ranks of the professoriate in industrialized nations has expanded to include women and minorities who were not, once not part of it. And even more dramatically, of course, the ranks of researchers from the global south has increased in the past several decades. China and India are just two of the elephants in the room. More researchers mean more research. Take China. In 1970, China issued 21 scholarly journals by 2019. 
it was 11,000. That is a good thing. And it's precisely this expansion of overall absolute scientific productivity in the post-war world that has produced this so-called problem that we face. The explosion of research is what prompted the science publishers to expand the number of journals. That was necessary and that was good. That doesn't mean that the massive increase in subscription costs that the scientific publishers foisted on the system at the same time was equally justified. That was just rent seeking. So on the one hand, we have more research, and on the other hand, each bit of it is costing us more to publish and read. We have two problems. One is the exaggerated cost foisted on us by the science publishers. But this is, relatively speaking, a smaller problem than the other. Uh, in other words, how to handle the ever great growing amount of research and information. That is the main problem. And in a sense, the publisher's rent seeking merely brings forward the time that we have to face it. They are aggravating the problem, but they have not created it. And indeed, I'm willing to argue that it isn't really a problem in the sense of something bad, any more than any embarrassment of riches is a problem. More research from more researchers is a good, and we need to figure out how to deal with it. A global digital library is possible only if we make producers pay for dissemination. For the sciences, it's a small additional cost to their already large research budgets. For the humanities and social sciences, it is much more of a problem. That is the core of the open access <coughs> dilemma at the moment, how to swing humanities and social science publication to open access. The brilliance of open access is that in one fell swoop, it solves the distributional injustice of the current system of spreading knowledge. Each nation in an open access system would be responsible for the costs of disseminating its own research. In return, it would gain access to the riches of global research. Small and poor countries would no longer be disadvantaged as they are in the analog system. In open access, they have to pay only for disseminating their own content, and in return, they receive the rest for free. This, it seems to me, is equity at its purest, from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Open access also largely solves the problem of political censorship. As long as the internet is not controlled, as it obviously is in some parts of the world, China and the Middle East, then it's very hard to ban content. If it's available on the web, you basically can't ban it. So in other words, open access achieves three big goals. Universal access to all scholarly knowledge, information equity across the globe, and undermining censorship. This, I venture to claim, is not bad for a movement that is primarily the province of librarians, techno geeks, and scholars. Thank you. Uh, our first talk at the speaker today is Harriet Deacon uh, from the University of Hull, where she teaches uh, in partly in history and also in the data science, AI, and modeling, modeling center, Dane. Uh, she was trained in Cape Town in Cambridge uh, and has done a great deal of work in the role of intangible heritage uh, in sustainable development uh, in various places uh, around the world, like India, uh, some of the stars, uh, and in Northern Europe. Uh, she was a consultant with UNESCO uh, for many years under the 2003 in in Intangible Heritage uh, Convention. Um, she has a particular interest and expertise uh, in AI, uh, in data management, and she's going to be looking at in particular, the, the chapters three and four from Peter's uh, book, Athena Unbound, uh, going to be looking particularly at the open access problem and its history. Uh, of course, like all the panelists, she may, what, she may uh, range more widely than that. Harry. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Trevor, for inviting me to part here on the panel. And thanks also to Peter. I really enjoyed this book. I think, uh, for me, it sets up quite clearly some of the challenges in improving the situation in scientific publishing and identify some of the areas where improvements could be sought. I think for me, one of the issues I'd like you to, to talk about a bit more in response to the questions is this question of interdisciplinary research and how the scholarly publishing scene disadvantages it interdisciplinary research uh, even more than it should be. And I think that this can be illustrated in some of the stats he gave, for example, on declining expenditures on books, which is mainly produced by the humanities, 
and a greater share for the scientific journal. And for me, it, as an interdisciplinary scholar with one foot in history and one foot in uh, artificial intelligence, um, this is the real challenge about where to publish and how to make sure that what one publishes is read by uh, people who are interested in the same kind of thing. And I think that the way in which a scholarly publishing um, sells the bundles, the way in which books are marketed, affects the uh, potential for interdisciplinary research. And I'd be interested to know uh, what Peter has to say about that. I think the second area where I think the, the book is very interesting is really the lobbying power and the economic stranglehold that scientific, the big scientific publishing houses have uh, on the area. And um, what's very intriguing is to see how they were able to maintain their position and in fact improve their position when faced with the transition to digital books and journals. So the, the lobbying power and the sort of economic power of the scientific publishing sector is illustrated in his book by his uh, discussion of digital rights management and the way in which the, um, uh, the, the publishing houses were able to treat <laughs> digital books in the same way that analog books are treated. For example, libraries can limit, have to limit the number of copies of a digital work that they sell. He was giving some examples of that. Uh, of it, the number of copies of a digital work that can be used at any one time. They have to pay more for a digital copy of work, even though it costs the publishers much less. And so I think that this question of the power of the publishing in, uh, industry to make the transition into a digital market without losing any real um, profit uh, is a very interesting uh, situation. And we contrast that with the situation of many creative sector workers who are now being told if they're a ballerina, they must retrain to be a computer programmer in the new world, the jobs are shifting. Um, and, uh, for example, the Art Directors Guild in the US now faces significant unemployment in the ranks of its members, art directors, set designers, illustrators, um, graphic artists, and so on, after the sag after strikes in, in Hollywood. Um, adjusting to the new digital environment with generative AI, where it's so cheap to create a copy and to create new works in the style of an artist. And we contrast sort of individual artists' response to a new digital environment compared to the way in which the publishing houses have been able to adjust. Um, and I think that this is an example of generative AI being applied in the publishing industry. You look at Elsevier, for, for example, who's partnered with OpenAI to create this new platform called Scopus AI, which it essentially is a subscription-only service using the full database of articles that are in the stable of Elsevier to allow academic subscribers to create summaries, to look for bibliographies. And this is really moving the publishing industry, not just from a distribution platform, to really um, a content analysis platform where they're not just taking the scientific articles and publishing them digitally or otherwise, but they're also offering a service on top of that where they're asking for new income uh, for analysis. And I think that this obviously happened after the publication of Peter's book, but I'd be interested to get his comments on. And then my last comment is really linked to my interest in the culture sector and what the work that has been done on open access in scholarly publishing, which is what uh, Athena Unbound focuses on, and uh, trying to think about 
um, how does one talk about not just open access in a scholarly sense, which is obviously justified in the sense that it's uh, knowledge that's funded by government, for example, but there is a debate in the culture sector about to what extent uh, there should be open culture and cultural, um, let's say, objects such as paintings that are out in the public domain should be available to all if they're in museums, for example. And uh, that debate has been somewhat more fractious because, uh, as Peter pointed out in his book, an artist uh, earns money and they earn a livelihood from their creativity. Um, and some of those works are out of copyright, but some of them are still in copyright. And, and so in the open culture debate, there's been a lot of discussion, not just about this question of, um, you know, is it fair for uh, copyright to, um, to limit access to culture, but there's been also a big debate about whether, for example, indigenous cultural artifacts or indigenous cultural content that is taken without permission uh, should be open for all, even if it's sitting in a, a museum somewhere. So it becomes much more complex when one moves from open, uh, open access in the scientific publishing world to the culture sector. Um, and uh, this is an area which uh, where Arcadia is funding some discussion. I'm actually going to Lisbon next week to a meeting of Creative Commons to discuss the question of open culture. And I think it's a much more complicated conversation. So I can see why Peter focused mainly on the scholarly field uh, in, his, um, in his book. I think even in the scholarly field, the field of scientific publishing, the solutions are not, a, are not easy ones. Uh, mainly because of the power of the scientific publishing industry. And I would also like Peter to comment on where he thinks any bargaining power might, might be found there. So I'll just leave my comments there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much, Sharon. It's my great pleasure to, to introduce Graham Duffield, uh, who is a professor, uh, is a law academic, professor of uh, international governance in the School of Law in the school at the University of Leeds, uh, previously having been a research fellow at Queen Mary uh, and was serving as an academic director of uh, at ICJDSD, UNCTAO, I hope I've got that right, uh, right. capacity building project uh, in Geneva. Yes, yeah, something like that. Something like that. It's basically the approach. Perhaps more, 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 to, more to the point for, for our purposes today, he's the author, among other works, of Duffield and South Atherton on global intellectual property law, and he's also written the history of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and he's going to discuss, in particular, chapters five and six uh, of Peter's book, uh, Athena Unbound, uh, particularly looking at, at uh, what open access means for the professoriate uh, and for digital disseminators. Graham. Thank you very much. Um, I can't really speak on behalf of, of professors as a, as a group. Um, um, I don't think I you know, have the right to exactly, but, uh, and that's, that's odd enough, I don't really talk that much to professors, because uh, I'm downstairs, and professors are upstairs, and for some reason they prefer me to be downstairs, uh, nearest to the exit, I'm not quite sure uh, what message they're trying to uh, communicate to me, uh, but I'm quite used to it now. Um, so, um, um, I, I rather enjoyed the opening of, of, uh, of chapter five, where we are sort of accused of our attitude to open access uh, of being uh, grounded in indifference and snobbery and otherworldishness. And um, do I agree with that? I, I, my first reaction was it's a little bit harsh, uh, but then I thought, well, uh, let me add to this. <laughs> Um, so I would, add, I would add the word ignorant as well, which is, uh, again, not going to make me too many friends among professors, uh, but I hope you'll forgive me for um, you know, uh, what I say will, will, will soon be forgotten, I expect. And, uh, 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 so, I mean, of what? Uh, and one thing I think 
uh, we do tend to be a little bit ignorant about is actually copyright law. Um, so, I mean, I wonder how many of us are happy to assign copyright to the publishers when we, uh, when we, when we uh, um, get articles uh, published. Uh, something I really think we should not do. Uh, I think we should all not assign copyright uh, to publishers. Um, now, the publishing industry, for me, you know, I've written a lot about the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and uh, they're notoriously uh, fairly ruthless and aggressive, and I think the publishing industry is absolutely no different uh, at all. I mean, academic publishing industry is absolutely um, no different. Um, so, um, <coughs> and of course, what's really important is not just what the copyright law says, but actually the actual agreement, that contract that you sign. Um, now, I'll tell you uh, a few little anecdotes. Now, in a way, I think the glass is also half full because um, a lot of stuff is freely available there. There's academia.edu, there's uh, ResearchGate, um, and then there's also SSRN. Uh, and, uh, and yet, that doesn't mean we don't have uh, a huge uh, problem. Now, ResearchGate, uh, some time back, I left ResearchGate. The reason why I left ResearchGate is that I um, was notified that an article of mine was, that I wrote myself was taken down and I was warned as to my future content uh, because of a complaint by Elsevier. Okay. Now, they didn't have the courtesy to tell me what it was, what article it was that was the problem. Okay. Uh, but I, I'm pretty sure uh, that I would have signed a license that allowed me to, to do this. But I can't prove it because I don't know what it was. <laughs> That, uh, uh, that was the, uh, the, the article issue. Um, now, of course, one thing many people don't realise is that there is copyright just not uh, in, in the work itself, there's copyright in the typographical arrangement. So it might have been the case that it was on the basis of the typographical uh, arrangement that I might have been infringing. But I don't actually know. But it's another layer of legal protection uh, that many people don't actually uh, know about. Uh, SSRN seems wonderful, except uh, I noticed once uh, that, and we're not talking about Springer or Elsevier, Oxford University Press uh, uh, created um, a, 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 a um, part of the site. Uh, in my name, without my permission, and they put on sale uh, a short article, uh, a, a, a very descriptive uh, one, one page book review uh, in the European Law Journal. Uh, and uh, what they were charging was something astounding. Um, and for that like one, you know, a one page descriptive article, uh, uh, and uh, certainly more than buying and the book, as you, as you, I think you, you mentioned once. This and uh, so um, I, I sort of complained, and they said, "Well, according to, to the license, you actually agreed to this." Um, so yeah, uh, we were culpable. <laughs> That's it. That was that was my ignorance. Um, okay, so um, clearly, in order to achieve what uh, what uh, Peter would, would like us to have. Um, is you know you're going to up against a lot of a very a, a very uh, powerful uh, lobby group, a very a, a very wealthy um, sector, and uh, that's going to be quite um, a challenge. But what about this attitude that we have toward open uh, access? And I have to to uh, admit I I love the idea. I think the the outcome uh, would be amazingly good. Um, but I think as academics, we, yeah, of course, there's the open access model that we have. Um, I suppose we sort of passively accept it, but we, we don't accept it with any kind of sense of mission. And I think that, uh, uh, that, that criticism is, is sort of warranted. Uh, uh, but why is that? And I think it's because, unfortunately, it is a scam. It is another form of corporate welfare as a publishing industry, which uh, 
Uh, and now even OUP is, is, is on the act as well. So it's not just Beringa and, and Elsevier. Okay, so um, what do I, so what do, uh, do I do? Do I put my money where my mouth is? Well, um, I have had, I do get requests and I always send them, I always email them. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, a couple of little, little, little stories. Um, uh, I wrote this book about history of the pharmaceutical industry and, uh, and um, um, I would uh, send all the chapters because that, because basically the publisher uh, PDF them all by chapter. Uh, but while searching the internet, I came across a pirated copy uh, from some, some dodgy website, uh, the whole book. So I thought, fantastic, so I've downloaded that, and now I, I actually send that to, uh, <laughs> send it to people who are, who I know would be able to afford to actually buy the book. Uh, another little anecdote, um, I was trying to find an article, I couldn't, I couldn't get anywhere from the university library um, by a quite well international lawyer uh, in the University of California, and I wrote to her, I emailed her directly and said, I'd love to have your article, I just can't get anywhere, do you mind, uh, if you could send it, I'd be very grateful. He says, uh, I, have look, I can't find it, uh, someone has stolen my laptop, and that's the only version that I knew there was. Uh, so I asked um, a, a younger colleague, uh, and I said, uh, could you help me? He said, uh, don't worry, and about five minutes later, he, he sent me a PDF version he had found somewhere. Uh, of course, um, uh, if you are sort of as silver-haired as I am, but you're lucky enough uh, to have um, younger people around in the house, um, they uh, have much more access than we have uh, because of the fact they know uh, they, they know where to find things uh, in a way uh, uh, that a lot of older people don't have a clue where to actually um, um, look. Uh, <coughs> so. Um, of course, as Peter Wright says, you know, at the end of the day, you know, somebody has to, uh, somebody has to pay. The, the money has to come uh, from um, somewhere. Um, and of course, you know, it's through, I guess a lot of us do feel, why are we giving free labour to the publishers? And of course, yes, we are paid salaries. Um, well, I'm not sure if I'm alone. As a professor, my salary has gone down every year. Uh, for 17 years in terms of purchasing power. Uh, so I'm a little, bit, a little less well off than I was 17 years ago when I actually started. But leave that aside, yeah, I don't expect anyone to uh, cry for me because uh, I'm a professor, I'm paid well above the national average. So I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, but of course, in a sense, who is being exported? Is it us? Perhaps we're not being exported, then we just complain too much. And, that, and that's a, a fair thing to, uh, thing to say. Uh, or is it the or is it the taxpayers? Uh, is it the taxpayers that uh, uh, you know they're the ones who, who are really paying? Um, I that's what they're also students. And as you know, we have well we have a lot of postgraduate students who are paying a lot a lot of money. So in a sense, are they actually 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 paying? Uh, so so who is being exploited? Uh, is that something uh, that's not entirely sort of clear cut? Uh, okay, so I think my time is just about about running uh, running out. Um, but uh, first, at the end of the day is um, R is I was talking about big pharma, the big drug companies do talk, big academic publisher, big book, uh, a big journal. I'm not quite sure we need to come up with some sort of journal here. Um, do we actually need them? Do they do they provide a service that others can actually do? Right? Can we circumvent the publishing industry? Um, it seems uh, perhaps like a little dream right now because they are so, they are so, uh, they are so powerful. Uh, and yet, um, you know, is there a way we we we, we can avoid these problems, making open access um, without uh, without going through, you know, as I say, one of the most ruthless industries uh, that we that we have. Uh, they are very good at monetizing. So. Okay, on that point, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's optimistic or pessimistic, probably more pessimistic than optimistic. Uh, but uh, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, our final speaker is uh, Dr. Reddy Pidgey Raju, uh, who is uh, joining us online from the University of Cape Town.
Uh, he's Director of Research and Learning at the Jagger Library of the University of Cape Town, uh, been a fellow at various, various places, in particular committed places where he's been committed to increasing access to information of residents of the Global South. Uh, he's a National, National Research Foundation rated research, researcher with a special focus on open access. Uh, and he's going to be concentrating in his comments uh, on that, both chapter seven and eight in the thing are unbound, particularly aspects of uh, that book uh, which connect with, uh, with, with global access uh, and particularly with, uh, he, he will give some insights uh, from the perspective of researchers and writers in Africa. Reggie. Thank, thank you very much. I think uh, what I would like to comment is the fact that Professor Baldwin throughout the book makes reference to the noble elements of open access and alludes to open access being hijacked by the commercial enterprise. For Africa, the open access movement has betrayed the continent, a movement rich in philanthropy, embedded in social justice principles. However, it is devoid of a rollout strategy that bridges the South-North knowledge divide. The, the element of inclusivity is absent from the current iteration of the movement, intensifying the marginalization of African scholarship. Undoubtedly, there is improvement in access to Global North content. But the sad truth is that opportunities for Africans to disseminate the scholarship is still very limited. There is significant, uh, significant focus in Athena Unbound on issues of finance and copyright. For the Global North, this may be the core of the challenges that serve as barriers. For Africans, this is the tip of the iceberg. African authors have a myriad of hurdles, a myriad of challenges to navigate to get published, aided and abetted by conscious and unconscious bias. These biases range from editorial and peer review bias to geographic and language bias. Then there is Contextual, contextual bias. African authors resort to what Peter associates with intellectual pilgrimage. The sum total of this pilgrimage is critical African issues being unresearched. In the land of equals, the rich pay more. Paradoxically, in the land of unequals, the poor pay more. Peter posits that, and I quote, sometimes developing countries such as South Africa have been built more than rich ones. It may make commercial sense where high rates of production reduces costs, but in this research landscape, it becomes an absurd, absurd notion that the poor subsidize the rich. In this inequitable playing field, African researchers have to wrestle with the heavyweights from the global north to publish in their journals. Those who have little to no resources to produce research have to now compete for those limited publishing spots. And then there is the issue of the cost of APCs. Often read and publish agreements are determined by the number of articles that are published. The more one publishes, the higher the discount, which in effect means that Africa will always be subsidizing the Global North institutions. At times, the cost of APCs is more than the total research budget of the researcher. And here I speak from personal experience. 
there is sporadic mention of diamond open access in the book. For us in, in Africa, and I would guess for many parts of the global south, diamond open access is the answer to the conundrum. All of the biases mentioned are managed by the marginalized. The issue of predatory publishing is eliminated as there are no financial transactions taking place. If the output is poor, it is the reflection on the author and or the institution. This serves as an internal or self-governance uh, in terms of quality. There is no dependence on experts to validate research where reviewers do not understand the context. This talks to the issue of post-publication review, which Peter addresses in the book. And this post-publication review impacts positively or negatively the capacity to attract good students, to attract funding and such. Peter shares that it is time to return control of scholarly publishing to the scholars. And he also makes mention of banding together to make open access workable. Diamond open access is the way to go. There is demonstrable evidence to show that the global South and Latin America in particular has made this model work. Librarians as acknowledged um, by Peter and in the book uh, in Athena Unbound are the major drivers of, of open access. We as librarians need to reinvent our services to support this philanthropic tropic, and social justice underpinned model. There is a need to transition into an area where the focus is on collection investment as opposed to collection development. The latter being extremely institution focused while the former is what Peter says calls the global library on the internet. We need to transition from collecting from the outside for the inside to collecting from the inside for the outside. The challenge in this diamond open access model is the issue of sustainability. Therefore, it is imperative to support the development of appropriate infrastructure and to collaborate across geographic regions. If the global South is going to take the lead, then so be it. For once, the global North would have to follow. To conclude, Athena needs to help flip the iceberg and bring equity to a movement that purports to make knowledge a global public good. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, thanks very much. Your name will go away. Yeah, uh, my name's Rob Bell, and I, I work for a, an AI company in, in Norway at the moment on many of these knowledge uh, elements. So thanks very much for a really enlightening talk. But um, most of my experience has been in the global south. Uh, I think some of the comments made by uh, Reggie have been really on the money in the sense of uh, making sure that there's an equity to, to knowledge. But uh, Peter, if I may, that you, you, you've closed with three points, and the third point links and ties the whole horror story together, and that is the control of censorship. Um, the issue that censorship is uh, something that really threatens and open access can combat. You know, God forbid that the publishing groups actually start being influenced by things like what's happening in Georgia right now, what's happening uh, in, in Russia right now in terms of controlling uh, democracy really. And so 
the one word missing in what I've heard so far really is the strengthening of democracy by addressing some of the issues that you raise in the book and that Reggie's just raised in terms of uh, his part. I'd be interested to see how you see that. And finally, um, uh, Harriet, you, you talk about AI. It seems to me that one thing that wasn't touched upon is we often see libraries as, uh, as a place of retrieval, and, but you've all mentioned better services, newer services. AI gives you an ability to not just retrieve a book off the shelf or a piece of knowledge off the shelf, but actually join the dots between loads of elements. And significantly advanced AI doesn't just search uh, for an author and a work, but can actually dig into um, all of these works and pick out sentences here and sentences there. That is going to actually dislocate the whole story. But it's also going to complicate it because if the publishers have the power, then the 5,000 5, authors could be part of this problem as well. So really it's this censorship, something of democracy point and the issue of the threat uh, that could be got rid of by the real role of AI in the future, which is not just retrieval, that's the simple bit. It's the joining of the dots across multiple facets of knowledge. I think that uh, there's Peter and Harry, and perhaps Reggie might want to comment. Peter. I totally agree with you. Strengthening democracy is an important part of this. I, it seems to me that every fiber of open access body is trends in that direction. Um, no doubt. You know, we live in an era that, in some senses, gotten even worse since the publication of the book, where our ability to distinguish between good information and bad information is becoming harder and harder. AI, excuse me, AI um, aggravates that. So let me go to your second point about AI, about which I have two quick things to say, and that is, first of all, AI desperately needs open access insofar as it doesn't want to suffer more than it already does from the garbage in, garbage out syndrome. It is already pushing at the limits, at the boundaries of the paywall sites, it probably has already transgressed them, but will not admit it, and will be forced to do so in court. We'll see if that works out. Uh, but insofar as it wants to have good quality output, it needs the scholarly input, and therefore it ought to cooperate with and probably pay for its, the information that it uh, uses. But that's sort of the good side of it, as it were. The bad side is that we don't yet know who owns the output of what AI generates. At the moment, in most countries, as I understand it, it can't be copyrighted. It seems very hard to believe that the IP industries are going to leave the problem in that situation. They have too much at stake here to not try to grab this prize as well. So my educated guess would be that they're going to win for AI the ability to have its copyright, uh, to have its content um, copyrighted you know, precisely who gets to be the author remains to be seen, but um, it's hard to believe that that won't get swallowed up into the IP system as well. Did you want to say anything, Harry? Uh, not much, except to say that I think uh, with Scopus AI, what they're doing is they're taking a large language model and then on top of that, they're using the data that Elsevier owns already to train a model on top of that and to sell products based on that. So I agree with you that I think that the future is these products trained on specific data sources that are uh, already published. And I think that's what the publishing industry is going to try and do, is sell new kinds of products in, in this new market. And as, Reg, you know, as Reggie was saying, you know, that the publishing industry has been very powerful and been very able to kind of control the, the, the economic benefits. So, Reggie, did you want to say anything? Maybe more to, to what Harriet had said. I mean, it is not possible to have a building without a foundation. Scopus AI can't work if the articles are not available. 
So you need to have the content. And as Peter said, the more content that is available in digital format, the better the result in terms of what AI uh, um, aggregates. But I think the, the, the major issue then is having adequate uh, citation conventions to acknowledge the, 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 the creative artists in, 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 in this process. Thanks, Trevor. Thank you very much. Amy. Okay, so uh, we have two questions online, um, both from anonymous attendees. And the first is, um, in saying that producers should pay for dissemination, do you draw any distinction between initial dissemination, um, so in analog terms, printing the book, and long-term dissemination, so making sure that the book stays available? Because um, the um, person says in digital terms, the latter can be quite expensive. Um, this is getting fairly uh, deep into the weeds here, but um, obviously somebody has to pay for the long term as well. And, uh, you know, backward compatibility and make, you know, what happens when publishers go belly up? Who takes care of the digital files? Uh, then? These are all issues. We have a few institution clocks and locks, for example, that kick in when a publisher doesn't, doesn't respond or is somehow not available, but um, obviously as more and more comes online, this could become a bigger and more expensive problem. Thank you. Second question. Um, so as somebody said, um, Dr. Raju, Raju makes excellent points about the open access movement, the trade global south. Um, and they've actually said, does Arcadia plan to fund any institutions um, you know, beyond the US borders? I'm so sorry. Does Arcadia plan to Reggie, Reggie's making make important points yeah. about open access. Is Arcadia planning to fund any uh, global stuff project? Um, Arcadia already funds some global stuff uh, projects. Um, I, I was going to come back to this, but I might as well say it now because Reggie, this is partly addressing your problem. I, I take your point um, that Africa has been mistreated. I take what I assume is your point that Plan S, the darling of the European open access movement, is not really very sensitive to the needs of anybody who doesn't have the funding available on the scale and style of the European scientific uh, establishment. But I would say that there is a bright point that is worth paying attention to, and that is Latin America, where basically everything is already open access at a very reasonable cost, paid for by the various uh, governments, and, and that it, it, it indicates that it can be done, indeed it has been done, and that possibly there's a model there that we should be following. And yes, Arcadia is uh, funding stuff in Latin America. Thank you. Um, Ian. Uh, thanks. I really enjoyed everyone's contributions. It's been a great hour and a half. Um, nobody's mentioned peer reviewers or the, the sort of the unpaid labor that makes all of this possible. Um, with this sort of, I think I probably got the numbers right, the sort of 10 billion pounds, 10 billion dollars is depending on keeping something an open access movement running, there's an additional 20, 30, 30 billion in the market at the moment. Is there a potential in this model for making that labor rewarded in some way? Any of you can answer. Yeah. Sure, if you can find the money. Uh, I mean, peer review, it seems to me, is sort of one of the Boy Scout aspects of academia. Um, I mean, there are many things that those of us who are lucky enough to be full-time and reasonably, in the grand scheme of things, um, well-paid academics do that isn't precisely sort of time-counted as I mean, faculty meetings aren't paid for either, and you know, me meeting admissions brochures, I mean, you know, portfolios, whatever you call them in this country. Um, I mean, there's a lot of sort of, you know, technically unpaid off-the-clock labor, of which peer review is just one example. So. If we are at the point where nobody will do peer review except getting paid, then then we're up against a rock. Um, and I, I don't quite know what the solution is to that. Um, it, it does require a certain degree of voluntarism, voluntarism, which may be seeping out of the system for all kinds of other reasons. Um, you know, some spirit of mutuality that is that is disappearing in the face of 
cutbacks and so forth, but that is obviously a big problem. Harry, Ryan, Ryan, I think. Just, uh, just a little response. I mean, personally, I actually think peer reviews ought to be paid as a, as a, a, a nominal sum. I actually think they should. Uh, so a lot of liberties are taken on us, you know. And I think a lot, a lot of uh, my academics would say, actually, we probably work more than the 35 hour weeks anyway. So actually, our writing, our peer review is actually done in our spare time in the evenings, early mornings, and on the weekends. Uh, so there is that argument. And I think a lot of me. Some of my, my, my less senior colleagues uh, are absolutely frazzled by the amount of hours that they, that they put in. Um, us older types have uh, had more freedom to actually say, well, no, I won't do that. You know? uh, but if you're trying to get promotion, get off a lecturer up to as a professor, you tend to be very obedient because you, you want the promotion. And yet some of the hours, they put, the stress that, I, that, that, that a lot of young and they go through is, is quite, it's quite worrying, I think. Okay. Maybe I can just add, you know, maybe it's a symptom that, you know, the kind of anger in the academic uh, environment about things like doing peer review for free, maybe that's also a symptom of how much uh, underlying anger there is against the scientific publisher's system, which one, where one feels taken for granted. So I think addressing some of those power dynamics might help. This is um, me uh, wearing a global south lens. Peer review does not necessarily have to be in terms of formal financial uh, reward. Peer review could also be used in terms of grooming the next generation of researchers. In some of the agreements that um, the consortia in South Africa have signed relates to making greater use of Global South peer reviewers. And for us then to lobby uh, um, the, the leadership of the universities to recognize peer review in part of the promotional processes. Thanks, Ter. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, you had another question? Sorry, Harvard. Just, yeah, I've never heard of uh, Scopes AI, I've heard of Scholar AI. And sort of, given how bad competition between universities and competition between publishers has been for scientific accuracy, it's sort of horrifying that an AI, uh, that, an, that you can build an AI model simply on one stable of journals, because you just create competition for more eye-catching journals that are more eye-catching research greater rate of false positives and all of the sort of other open research issues that we face. So I don't really have a question, but it's horrifying that they would train a model purely based on one publisher's outputs because it will only lead to worse scientific research in the end. Hey, Harry. I should say that uh, Ian is the, uh, the, the leading person in this university about open research and open science. Yeah, I mean, I. I was just asking about it because I saw on the Elsevier website and that's what they described. So you can go and have a look there. Um, but it did seem to me be, I wondered if that was the direction of travel for all the publishers. Um, and perhaps uh, we've got a lot of comments, a lot of little questions raised in the panel. So Peter, uh, we'll, we'll give you the floor to, to respond to, as you, as you wish to, what these issues have come up today. Thank you. Well, uh, a number of things have already been said, and I won't bother repeating them. Um, I was struck by the essence, I would say, the comments. Thank you, all three of you, for your comments. Um, perhaps not quite gloomy, but but you know, what should we say? Wary and a bit and a bit uh, cynical. Graham, um, you know, scam versus scam. Um, <laughs> maybe it is a scam. You know, if if it's true that the publishers also get something out of it, uh, that may well be. Um, Harriet, you raised a lot of issues about the, the sort of the looming power of, of the publishers and what they're doing, and I don't dispute any of it. I'm rather pessimistic about the role of publishers incre increasingly uh, as we move into the uh, digital era. You touched on the, their role as data managers, because after all, the publication, the last little bit that's sort of finally squeaks out of the system, 
in a sense, I think they probably already have given up on that. That's not really where the money is, and that's not where the future is. They're you know, working their way back up the chain and now managing the data. This is, again, something that is going to mean less for those of us in the HSS field than it is in our sciences, where they you know, have serious amounts of data, and it's straight off the cold face and needs to be. So there, it's unclear to me that the public has a large interest in things being one way or the other. And it, it's unclear to me that, that they aren't the best position to actually be doing this, but I'm ignorant and I don't have a strong opinion about this one way or the other. It seems to be that where it rubber hits the road and where you want the information out, you don't want the publishers having a monopoly on the data. Who knows? But I mean that that may be those who are sophisticated enough to want to troll the data and are kept out because the publishers have a monopoly. Obviously, we have the same sorts of issues uh, there um, all, all over again. When it comes to things like bundling their collections for libraries, clearly a nefarious influence because they effectively give you all or nothing smorgasbord of choice and do I have to pay it all or not. They do do a bit of distinction between big and large libraries and expensive institutions and so forth in terms of pricing, but it's all completely opaque and we have no idea. And as Reggie pointed out, sometimes the third world institutions get hit with you know, higher prices than, than first world institutions and you know, other injustices um, like that. But there's an even bigger issue looming here that I worry about, and that is the, as books increasingly, as content increasingly becomes digital, the libraries, which are supposed to be the repositories of our collective culture, are more and more marginalized by the publisher. So, you know, an ebook is something that a library doesn't buy it, it doesn't own it, it doesn't curate it, it doesn't store it, it is simply the middle person between funding, funneling money from the funders, wherever they may be, to the publishers and, and funneling the bytes from the publishers servers back to their own lenders or borrowers, uh, rather. And so the libraries are increasingly marginalized in this whole enterprise. And so for, for your average public library where people are reading the latest best you know, that may not be the end of the world, but for research libraries where the stuff is supposed to be forever, that is a real problem. For example, I mean, above all, the thing that worries me the most, I wake up in a cold sweat at night about, is the public domain in a digital age. So the first ebooks are now out, and I mean, they have been for a few years, but at some point there will be books that are really only, do not exist in any physical form, unless somebody goes to the bother of printing out a PDF. Life plus, what did we agree, 70 or 90, I always forget. What? 70, life plus 70, so you know, basically 130 some years, depending on how old the author is, from now, when that digital ebook goes into the public domain, who's gonna be there? Who's gonna have it? Who's gonna say, voila, here is the file, you can do with it what you will. The libraries don't have it. Some defunct publisher servers, God knows you know, what's become of that. The locks and clocks organizations of the world, I mean, these are private organizations with limited funding, and we're really gonna rely on them uh, a century and a half from now. I just don't believe that we know yet whether there's going to be a digital public domain down the road. And that seems to be a really big problem that we haven't um, uh, yet solved. I mean, right now there's, there's even a question here of what digital deposit in national libraries is an odd fish. The one thing in the US is digital deposit of any sort has just been ruled uh, illegal. Uh, in other countries, there are laws about depositing digital files, and many countries are not. So I mean, we haven't even solved that problem. So anyway, I, I too worry about the increasing role of publishers and the increasingly nefarious role of publishers. Um, let me just say one final thing about open culture, about which I know very little. Uh, but it seems to me that at some point, if we're talking about effectively three-dimensional objects, not just the two-dimensional ones, the PDFs and academic research, and the world that it's in. Happen. Digitality is sort of taking care of the two dimensional objects, but digitality will someday soon also take care of the three dimensional objects. And three dimensional objects will have their Benjamin moment and also become part of the re reproducible uh, world. And they will be indistinguishable from the, the so called authentic objects. And when that happens, then every museum can be the British Museum or the Met or the Louvre in the same way that every zoo is basically the same thing. You know, there, are, there are better and worse zoos, but on the whole, zoos are zoos, right? They all have every damn animal. They're basically, you know, they're Noah's Ark. 
insofar as one can have a Noah's Ark. And the, every museum can be a world-class encyclopedic collection once you allow for some kind of replication of the objects that you want to look at. And if you want to do it really well, of course, what you do is you take the so-called pathetic objects and you distribute them randomly throughout all the museums and you invite people to guess which ones are the real ones and which ones aren't. And at the point when they cannot longer tell, then you're home. And so in that sense, I think we're going to have you know, very similar debates for museums that we've had for archives and for libraries. Thank you very much, Trevor. Uh, just so to say, so, I'm Chris Orr at the University Librarian. Thank you very much for everyone online, in particular, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, it struck me as I was sort of listening to the various speakers, I was right in a sense pleased uh, or struck by Reggie's display of an iceberg um, as part of his uh, presentation, which essentially was to highlight the fact that, again, that tip of the iceberg and then so much beneath it. And the strange thing about open access, which has been around now for decades, uh, well, unless, depending on how you define it, but in terms of how we understand it, decades, um, feels a little bit like an iceberg insofar as that on the face of it, open access is a remarkably simple thing. And it's a small thing. It's simply about, if I have some knowledge, I share it with you openly. And if that was simple equation could be uh, demonstrated, put into practice, then I'm sure all of us would be far happier. Um, and that's what the dilemma being, as we have heard today, is that there's a whole host of issues which are the nine-tenths of the iceberg that we don't see, but which keep bubbling up to breaking off and coming up to the surface in terms of complicating the scenario that we encounter, complicating that simplicity, that joy and sense of simply sharing knowledge, sharing information. Having said all that, uh, one of the joys of uh, Peter's book and Peter's talk has been very much highlighting that where there's a will, there is a way and that there is the possibility, the capability, of actually making open access work. We just have to have the determination and the will to try and do that. I was also struck by one of your comments in the, uh, what you said at the end there, was that one of the risks we have is that um, in trying to make open access work, where is that will? And one of the dilemmas which I have encountered in my career working in libraries is that libraries do sometimes feel more marginalised in the equation, in the debate, far from and move far away from where they were in the sense of the bastions of the knowledge. Now that has its downsides. To some extent, it forces us to think about what our upsides are and to work out what value we can add to the equation, what value we can bring to that debate, and what value we can actually uh, bring to making open access achieve what has been set out in um, Peter's book. Um, so on that basis, thank you very much for highlighting that and very much want to sort of put libraries back in the centre of uh, the debate uh, and be able to take this forward. Overall, however, I would very much want to thank you very much for uh, your talk, for your presentation, uh, for the book itself, uh, which I think has stimulated a very powerful debate very powerful and raise some very important issues that we all need to engage with and which will all helpfully, hopefully, move us towards a position where we can actually realise the benefits of what we are seeking to achieve through the sharing of knowledge um, globally. Thank you very much to yourself, Peter, and again to reiterate what Trevor said to all our panellists, both here in the room and online, and thank you very much again to everyone for coming along this afternoon.